Amen. If you'd please stand. Just two verses from Psalm 150. This morning I finished the Psalms through again. And Psalm 150 says this, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. And the last verse says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Father, I am thankful uh, for a desire to praise You. That's something You put within us. I am thankful for the opportunity not only to praise You on my own individually, but collectively like this with brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray that our praise will be found pleasing to you today. Holy Spirit of God, give us a a renewed joy, adoration, and praise for you, the true and living God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I left a couple verses out of Psalm 150. Praise him with the lute, lute and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Amen, amen, amen. Everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. Does it really say that in the Psalms? <laughs> Check it out. Psalm 150. Praise God for his spirit that dwells within. Jesus said in John 7, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. But the spirit has been given. Jesus has been glorified, and the Spirit of God dwells within those who have been born of the Spirit. You know, we were singing, Blessed Be His Name, and my mind went back to riding on a bus into Mexico, Sedad Victoria, Mexico. And that was, I think, one of the first times or recent times that song was had just come out. And there was a, a pastor and his wife there, and she went through a lot of health issues. And And this pastor was one of the most outgoing with the gospel people that I can recall. So that was a, a fond memory. And just 
that came back to mind and a challenging memory that came to mind as far as uh, being willing to be all out, all in, and all out for, for Christ. It's easy to give him praise when things are going well, but can we give him praise when our world feels upside down? Job says, Negadi came into this world, Negadi will go out. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away, has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Does the Bible really say that? Read it for yourself in Job. Job would also say, though he slay me, yet I will praise him. Job also says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and I shall see. With his own eyes, he will see it. Well, please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. We're going to finish up another chapter already. Hard to believe, but uh, we are. And in your bulletins, I believe it says uh, we'll be starting with verse 34. I want to back it up a little bit. As you know, I like to do that. Simply entitled, Suffering Shame for His Name, for Jesus' Name. The, the apostles rejoiced that they could suffer shame for His Name. That they could be, uh, they counted it honorable to be dishonorable. They, they counted it as the grace of God to be disgrace for God. That's what they, that's how they saw it. Do we see it that way? Well, we'll begin uh, with verse 29, but Peter, Acts chapter 5, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. You need to live with that mentality, church. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if, if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him. And when they called for the apostles and beaten them, that actually means scourged them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Let's stop with that. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this historical narrative here that we find in your word. Father, we know that your word says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And not only he, but yourself and your blessed spirit. It does not change. You're the immutable God. And so, Father, that same courage and that same boldness that your spirit imparts is there for all of us. Help us to not be so timid 
Help us to not rely on our own strength. But help us to be bold and courageous. Help us not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Father, help us to set ourselves aside. Help us to let your spirit not only dwell within, but for your spirit to speak out of us the wonderful things of the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I asked a loved one the other day, I said, why don't we share more? I said, including myself, why don't we share our, our faith more? And quickly the answer came, rejection. How many can relate? We're concerned what people will think. We, we want to get along with people. We want to appease people. We want to be friends. We don't want to be confrontational. Jesus was willing to make himself of no reputation. We need to do the same. To not be so concerned about our reputation and to be so concerned about people rejecting us, but to be more concerned of people rejecting Christ and be willing to share. The Christian Post in June of 2022, an article, and in that article it says 70% of Christians have not shared with a stranger the gospel in the past six months. Let me say this right up front. I am not trying to lay a guilt trip on you. I was so convicted yesterday about, Scott, you don't share like you should. And I'm the pastor. But don't get me wrong, I share. But I'm not nearly as bold with the good news of Christ of what I read of the apostles here. I mean, I was so troubled, I felt like jumping in a truck, going to Walmart, grabbing a car, and start going down through the aisles, praying. What can, what, praying for what? To figure out what you forgot on the grocery list? No, praying about what to share. You know, give me an opportunity to share. Instead, our mentality at times can be this. I got to go to the store. I hope nobody sees me. I hope I run in, don't run into anybody. I want to get in and I want to get out. Why is it that way? Because we have our own agenda. We have our own will. We have our own to-do list. And we have our own priorities. But as a child of God, someone who has been the recipient of his grace, of his forgiveness, of him rescuing us and delivering us from the eternal condemnation that awaits for all those who do not know Christ. For us who know Christ, it is now our responsibility to make Christ known. A lot of churches have that for their mission statement, to know Christ and to make him known. That should be every child of God's mission. To grow in our knowledge of Jesus, to grow in our love for him, and to share him with others. Crosswalk, Crosswalk had an article, and it was by uh, Dare to Share Ministries. Maybe you've heard of that. When choosing between being accepted by others and sharing the good news of Jesus with others, too often... Christians choose silence. Why? Let me give you four reasons they mention. Fear is the biggest culprit that keeps Christians from evangelizing. That's that rejection thing. What are we really afraid of other than rejection? 
The next reason, I won't spend a lot of time on this, is ignorance. What do you mean? I'm afraid somebody will ask me, challenge me about it, and I won't be able to give them the answer. Remember, these are all excuses. And please remember that I share with, I, I experience those same challenges. Please know that. Arrogance is another answer. As if people feel that's beyond them. Crosswalk's article said this. We pray the we pay the preacher to do that. It's his responsibility. No, my responsibility, read this for yourself. It's in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 4 is to equip the church. That's to equip the sheep to go out there and gather other sheep. I'm to be right there doing it. Paul said to young Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. And regularly at Living Bread Ministries, every Wednesday down there, unless something failed. I've passed that baton. I've moved on to, or allowed others to move into that position and, and share. All right. I still have a responsibility. But you and I, need, we need to move from being a, feeling responsible and, and, and duty demands it to out of love and devotion. Here's the other reason. Apathy. Basically... We're saying we don't really care about the loss. I didn't coin the phrase, but it's like this. We, we need to live with the mentality, the understanding that every person that we see, and I'm looking in people's eyes right now, every individual that we see has an eternal soul. We're, we're wrong. Me. Us. As God's children, we're wrong to withhold the gospel from other people. We were praying this morning. I said, this isn't going to be an easy sermon to preach. But please, please hear me again. I'm as guilty as the rest of you for not sharing. And you might be sitting there, well, I share a lot. Praise God. I'm thankful that you do. But let's, let, can, can we all do a little better? And sharing the gospel? What if we start with that? What if we start praying? In fact, let me use that uh, as a review and, and not as an intro. We're already minutes into the intro. But let, let's think about the apostles. And, and let's think, I mean, the Christian faith. Millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of followers of Jesus Christ. My pastor friend showed me a picture I shared with you about a video last week. He also showed me a picture of, of a couple of Chinese men. And, and one was over the, had the responsibility of being over 10 million house church Christians. Can you imagine? So Christianity has grown and grown and grown and continues to grow. Did I say grown? Not grown. You know what I mean. Uh, to countless souls now. I want you to think. It started with 120 people. It started with Jesus. It started with, with John the Baptist with the message, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus coming in and saying the same thing, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that gospel message was at the heart, is at the core of, 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 of the apostles' message. Think back of them gathered together, 120 in that upper room. And what are they doing? They're praying. Unified prayer. And what does God do with that unified prayer? He brings the Holy Spirit. The promised Holy Spirit comes. The day of Pentecost. The early church is birthed, if you will. 
And upon that day, 3,000 souls were saved. In Acts chapter 4, they prayed. The church prayed. They prayed asking God to give the apostles boldness. The Holy Spirit filled them when they spoke the, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. The Holy Spirit will give boldness for us to share Christ. Are we praying that way? Of those four things that I mentioned to you, which one do you struggle with the most? Is it the fear, the rejection thing? Is it, well, I, I don't feel adequate, I, I'm ignorant to the things of God? Do you feel it's not your responsibility? Or is it apathy? Oh, that God would light our hearts afresh to share the good news. You know, and the other thing is, I wonder sometimes if, if people really deep, 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 deep down inside of them really believe it. Oh, they go to church. They might read their daily bread. They might read the Bible a little bit. But do they really believe it? Because if you really believe it, you can't but help to share. So I'm just praying that God do a stirring in all of our hearts. Well, let's let's look at these verses and let's unpack them today and let's make some application. So in verse 32 and 33, they, they were put in jail for preaching the gospel. Peter boldly said to them, and I'm going to read it in verse 28. Did we not? They said, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. They were faithful witnesses. Their bold proclamation of the gospel had basically turned Jerusalem upside down. Thousands upon thousands of converts. And of course, it irritated the, the council, the Sanhedrin. They were losing popularity with the people. They were jealous. They were envious. And Peter, and they were told then not to preach anymore. And that's where uh, Peter said, no, we've got to obey God. And so Peter then says in verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. He held their feet to the fire and says, you're guilty. You're guilty. You're guilty. But God is gracious and God is merciful. And if you'll just repent of your sins, you too can be saved. And it's him who has been exalted to the right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Peter's using the opportunity the second time to preach to the Sanhedrin. And he says in verse 32, and we are witnesses to these things. You know, I was thinking of the woman at the well. It's in the Bible, Acts, or John chapter 4. I encourage you to read it. You say, because you may be sitting there thinking, well, these were apostles. These were hand-selected by Jesus himself, and, and that's what they were supposed to do. But I, I'm just a nobody. The woman at the well, in and out of relationships. In, in another one at the time that Jesus talked to her. Jesus lovingly declared to the woman he knew all about her. And, and then she, with that encounter of Jesus, leaves her water pot, puts down, sets it down, and walks off telling the people, come see the man who told me everything that I have ever done. Is this not the Messiah? You see, she just simply shared what Jesus had done for her. She simply shared her faith. She simply shared what Jesus had done for her. Read it for yourself. And many of the Samaritans came to saving knowledge of Jesus because that woman shared her message. Well, 
the apostles are sharing their message. And they said, this is what we're supposed to do. We are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. You see, the same power that lived within those apostles, that same boldness, that same courage is there for you and I today. Think about it. They were fishermen, a few of them. One was a despised tax collector. You know, any of us could put our names in there as far as our background and stuff, and, 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 and we would fit the description of a witness of Christ. Right? So those who lovingly obey him, And that's what we're called to do, to love Jesus in return and to obey his teaching. And one of the teachings, one of the commandments is that we're to be salt and light to this earth. We're to let our light shine. Jesus calls us to that. And the apostles, they're being obedient to their calling, to their commission. Well, sharing the gospel doesn't always bring favorable results. As we see here, I rest in the fact that God's word will not return void. He's going to accomplish with it what he will. I rest on that. There's lots of times I'll leave here, make my drive to Faith Bible Church, and I'll rest in that. Where it felt like it went over with a lead balloon and I had gravel in my mouth and couldn't get anything out. I rest in the fact that God's word does not return void. But I also know this, that when God's word is shared, it's not always received well. And this is what we see in verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious, and they plotted to kill them, kill them, the apostles. Now, this would be the Sadducees, the the part of the Sanhedrin that were the Sadducees. What happens next? This is where we pick pick up from last week. Verse 34. Then one in the council, that would be the Sanhedrin, 71 members made up of Pharisees and uh, Sadducees, stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. I could go on for hours telling you about Gamaliel. And I thought, I don't want to get sidetracked. That's not the main point here. That is not the main point. I will tear, share a little bit about him, though, just so you know. And, and that is this. He, he was, I think, as far as a good condensed explanation, and I've read, I've read plenty of scholars, but those of you who have a Nelson Study Bible, I think that's a great little condensed uh, snippet on who Gamaliel was. He was a highly respected Pharisee, the grandson of the famous Rabbi Hill. A brilliant spiritual leader. Gamaliel was the teacher of who? Can you tell me? Paul. Yeah. Paul sat at his feet, learning from him. Uh, Gamaliel was given the honor, honored title of Rabban, meaning our teacher. And in the commentary of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, in the Mishnah, uh, it says when Gamaliel died, which was 18 years before the destruction of Jerusalem, the glory of the Torah ceased and purity and sanctity died also. In other words, this is how respected this man was. He was the teacher of Israel. I know Nicodemus is a teacher of Israel, but, but this is the one that everybody looked to. And he was well respected, very re- well respected. And that carried weight. Uh, Here's how he works as far as uh, just his behavior, a little bit more on that. And this is from John Stott. Uh, he was very diplomatic. Gamaliel, a Pharisee, exhibited more, more of a tolerant spirit than the rival party of the Sadducees. He had a reputation for scholarship, wisdom, and moderation and was honored by all the people. So, so here's a guy who was well-liked. Here was a guy that was well-respected. Here was a guy that was well-honored. So do you think they're going to listen to what he has to say? Absolutely. 
In fact, when it came to the Sanhedrin, I'm sure when things were discussed, everybody would look over. Hey, Gamel, whatever they might have called him for short, I don't know. What do you think? And he would tell them what he thought. And this is what he's telling them this time. Because he says this. He, so he, so let's look at his worldly wisdom. Let's look at his experience. Here's a sage, okay? And he says, hey, let's set these guys, tell them to depart. Let's, let's clear the room. Let's, let's talk. So he put them outside. Next. It's right there in your Bible. You can be reading. Maybe you're reading a different translation, but this, the, it's the same thing. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. What's he tell them? Our language? Cool your jets. Just slow down. Get a hold of yourselves. Let's not be working, going, or acting in haste. Let's not start an uproar with Rome. You guys are mad to the point of wanting to kill them. That would not be a smart thing to do right now. For this plan or is this work? And let me fill in 36 and 37 because I, I didn't have it as a, as a PowerPoint. But, but he, he gives two examples. He gives two examples. Uh, he says in verse 35, men of Israel. And I, I was thinking about this too as, as far as men of Israel. Peter addressed them twice that way. And now they have one of their own saying, men of Israel. So, so they're hearing, they're listening. Now this was way before E.F. Hutton speaking, okay? Gamaliel, when he speaks, okay, we're listening. And he addressed them, men of Israel. Uh, okay, that's a title. They have responsibility. They have the, the, the spiritual religious responsibility of the people. Here's the spir spiritual leadership of the people. So in just that, that should have checked them a little bit. He said to them, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves that you, what you intend to do regarding these men. And so then he gives this explanation. And I'm going to read it again real quickly. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody. Now he's... he's we see the results. After this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census. Okay. What's he saying? And, and a little bit about these two real quickly again because this is not the point. He was using this as an example of two rebels, if you will, rising, making an insurrection, if you will, and, and the results of that rebellion. So this Thutis, we don't see anything else in, in Scripture about him. Uh, he was a self-styled leader with about 400 revolutionaries, okay, who was slain, and those who followed him were scattered. And then this Judas of Galilee, and there's another one, but uh, there was plenty of those named Judas. Judas of Galilee, another fanatic who stirred up uh, sedition among the Jews, he also perished, and his followers were dispersed. He's using that as an example. The only thing is, we're not talking about 400 people. We're talking thousands and thousands of Christians. And we're not talking about a revolt against the government. We're talking about people's lives being transformed and signs and wonders being done. And that was not the case with neither one of these guys. So Gamaliel intervened. He intervened. But as far as his answer, I find it weak. But we ought to trust this in God's working. And that is this. God's predetermined plan was going to march forward. 
it continues to march forward. Scholars will call it his providence. And in a way, Gamaliel was saying, well, it's, it's going to go as God would want it to go, and that part is true. But I really believe he failed. Yes, he gave practical advice. He gave logical advice. It, yes, it was wise in ways of the world, if you will. This is the right thing to do. Hey, just calm down. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's not be co committing a crime here. But why didn't he say, look, what does the word of God say? Maybe we should examine this a little bit more about Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Hey, we can't deny that these that signs and wonders and miracles have been taking place. We can't deny the transformation in these thousands of people's lives that we can see that's evident right now before us. Maybe we ought to look to the law and see, did the law say anything about a Messiah coming? But he didn't do that. That's where he failed, and I believe he failed miserably at that. But God did use that if you will, to keep the apostles at that time from being slain. He did. In Acts chapter 8, we read that persecution really broke, breaks out, and the disciples are scattered, but the apostles are not. They're still in Jerusalem. Why? Because everything's in God's timing. Everything's in God's timing. So they followed his advice. They, they accepted his advice, his advice. But really, it was God's doing. We need to live with the mentality in trusting in God's sovereignty and his providence. This is a short saying, but I'm going to say it. We've got to live with the mentality, God has this. He's got it. God's got this under control. He had that under control then. He continues to have things under control. Let me read a couple verses from the Old Testament. In Isaiah 46, 9, where it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Whose counsel stands? God's. Always. It did then. It did when they were crucifying Christ. That was God's predetermined plan to bring salvation to those who call on the name of Christ. In the Psalms, it says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. When the early church prayed in Acts 4 after their first imprisonment, they, they prayed this, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together, in verse 28 of Acts 4, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. It was not time for the, the apostles to be martyred. God used, just like he used Darius and Cyrus and various kings, he used Gamaliel to bring those words of wisdom, if you will. His, his advice, again, wasn't completely right. Because there's a lot of evil plans that continue on. Right? Not everything evil fails. But it is true that things are of God even though they may seem failing, God's plan will never fail. And we have to rest in that. So in Acts 40, here's what, what, or 5, verse 40, it says this. Don't be looking for Acts 40. There isn't any. After 28, you're done with that. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they scourged them. And it's like, why did they have to do that? Because they were filled with envy and wanted to kill them. That was sort of a compromise. Well, okay, Gamelia, we'll let them go, but we're going to beat them first. We're going to scourge them. That, that, that will silence them. That will silence them. 
And then they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. Well, what kind of effect did it have? What kind of effect did it have? Scholars say that they would have got scourged with 39 lashes because uh, it wasn't permitted to any more in case they were they were concerned about breaking the law. They wanted to be legal about their scourging. They didn't want to carry it too far. Well, the result, what did it have? Now, here's the result. We, we read it. So they departed. And notice what they did, how they departed. They didn't depart discouraged and go into hiding. They didn't do that. No, they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing. You know, the Apostle Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say what, church? To rejoice. (laughs) They're rejoicing. That's why Paul and Silas at midnight in Acts 16 could be singing after being beaten themselves, be singing praises and hymns to God. Why? Because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. We, we experience any little bit of suffering and we want to whine. If we don't share, we're not going to suffer. At, lo- at least not for the cause of Christ. I pray this encourages you and I to be bold and be obedient and be witnesses for Christ. No, they left the scene rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. You know, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It comes with the territory. We hear, we hear that, right? We say that. It, well, it just comes with the territory. How many Christians don't even think that suffering comes with the territory? How many Christians... Don't even give it a thought that witnessing and sharing your faith with others comes with the territory. I really think a lot of Christianity today is a matter of, I want to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. Other than that, I might make it to church some, I might read it some, I might read the Bible some, but other than that, I, I don't really want involved with anything. That's not Christianity. That's not biblical Christianity. Well, it doesn't stop there. No, it, it not not by far. Not only did they rejoice, but daily in the temple, right there in the temple, they kept teaching. But not only in the temple, but it says, and in every house. So they're they're sharing their faith during the time of of prayer the normal times of prayer at the temple and the temple courts. But everyday life for them was sharing as they visited. And I think that's another thing with Christianity. Too often it's it's a Sunday thing instead of a way of life. This life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is to be our mentality. We really need to live with, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We really need to live as children of God Not my will be done, but your will be done. Okay, I've got this going on today. This is my plans. Maybe these are my requirements. This is what I have to do. I've got to go to work. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. But are we going into that with, okay, Lord, this is what, what is before me, but first and foremost, help me to live for your glory and honor and help me to live for the furtherment of the kingdom. Help me to live to be as a, w- a witness for you. Instead of going to the store and wanting to avoid people and just get in and get out, help me to see that everything that I'm to do today, I'm to do it kingdom-minded. I'm to do it with the mentality of there are lost souls all around me. 
that you are calling and drawing and want to use me as an instrument, as a vessel to share the good news of Christ with. I don't know how many people are here. I don't count. But what if every one of us, what if just half of us go leave here today with that mentality and not let go of it? You're going to see more and more people of the area come to save in knowledge of Christ. Because God uses his people to save his people. Those who are not saved yet, he uses us sharing his word to bring them to saving knowledge. Well, they rejoiced. I wonder if during the beating they they thought of this. Jesus is teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. If we can have that. Blessed are you. Blessed be your name. Right? When there's pain in the offering. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. I'm afraid of rejection. (laughs) What are they going to do? What are they going to do? Laugh at you? I don't want to be laughed at. Put your reputation aside. Man up. <laughs> Blessed are you when they revile you, persecute you, say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. We're so- talking about suffering for his name's sake. Not suffering because we live in mortal, decaying bodies. We, 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 we do. We all suffer that way. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Heaven itself is a reward. Living forever in the glory of God. Unhindered praise. No presence of sin. Ah, What a reward. For those, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus saying it comes with the territory. They hated me, they're going to hate you. That's what he's saying. Well, Peter said this too. And and again, I, I often think when I read uh, the Word of God, uh, when I read a particular epistle, I, I think of their mind going back to their encounter of Christ and, and Christ's teaching to them. And so here's a couple from from uh, from Peter. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. Can we start seeing it that way? When they scoff and they mo- or, and they scoff and mock you, just start smiling. <laughs> Why? Well, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on me. I must be doing something right. They're getting ticked. If you don't say anything, you're not going to get scoffed at. You're not going to get mocked at. But as sooner or later as a child of God, the spirit of God will say, hey, What happened? You you had the opportunity. Why, why why didn't you share? He doesn't beat us up. He's not an accuser of the brethren. The Holy Spirit doesn't work that way. And we have to admit I missed that one. Yeah. But I'll give you strength and I'll give you power and I'll give you opportunity. Try it again. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he corrects. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. That's what we're to do. I'm going to bring this in for a landing. And uh, so let's just remember a few things and make this application, okay? So Paul said in Romans, he said this, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces what, church? Yeah. You know, no pain, no gain in, 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 a, in, in a sense. How do we grow spiritually? By sharing our faith. By reading the word, by praying, all those things. But it's things that we experience that helps bring endurance, right? And here, particularly, the suffering. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. 
That's the living hope that Peter talks about. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So to say as a Christian, I don't have what it takes to be a witness for Christ is calling God a liar and calling his word nothing but lies. No, 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 the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that empowered the, uh, er, the apostles and the early disciples empowers us. You ask the Holy Spirit of God, give me boldness, help me to share. Guess what he's going to do? Did you ever hear that saying, be careful what you ask for? He's going to give it to you. He wants to make big of Jesus, and he makes big of Jesus through Jesus' followers. That's what he does. And so, we need to remember, as Paul also said in Philippians 1.29, where it says this, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only... That's, there's to be a why. Only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. It comes with the territory. And now lastly, almost lastly, I, I just was reminded of this, of who we are in Christ. Do you not know that your body, and, and contextually I understand that what's going on, you can look at it. It's in the Bible. You can read the preceding verses. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? The Holy Spirit is in you. We house God. Isn't that a crazy thought? Whom you have from God and you're not your own. You see, when we come to Christ, and you, you might be thinking, wait, I didn't read that in the small print. I didn't read the small print. And, and oftentimes that's how the gospel is peddled. It's, it's, it's peddled just simply believe and your life will be filled with peace and, you, or with peace and your socks will be blessed right off of you and everything will be fine. Show me that in Scripture. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are whose, church? Now I belong to Jesus, right? Jesus belongs to me. Uh, and that is for eternity, he does. Lastly, lastly. Yeah, amen. That was, yeah, I, I made the connection there. Omen. He died for all people. Who died for all people? Jesus. So that those who live, and that is live the new life, live with the Spirit of God dwelling within us, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died and rose for them. Church, we... I pray that the Spirit of God will move it from being duty and responsibility to a delightful devotion and privilege to share to share the one who saved our souls. Please stand. Our Father, I thank you for the new life that we have when we, by faith, acknowledge our sins to you, our rebellion, our rejection, our running away from you, and when you call and you draw, and we, by faith, turn from our sins and embrace Jesus and trust him for your children. And as your children, we are called to be image bearers, to be Christ-like, and to be witnesses. Help us formerly lost people who have now been rescued, delivered, with the life of Christ now within us. Share him with the lost. 
if there are any in our presence here today that are experiencing your speaking to their hearts. There's a churning, there is a beckoning, and they can't deny it. As your word says, seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. God, I pray people will act on that. that They will turn and trust. Turn from their sin and trust Jesus. And if any does that here today, or have done that here today, that they let us know so that we can be praying for them and help disciple them. All for your glory, in Jesus' name. Thank you.
Father, we read there in Revelations where the saints sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Father, we thank you for Jesus, the one who loved us and washed us of our sins in his own blood. Help us to live for him who died for us. In his name I pray.